professor in the um, Department of Information and Library Sciences here in the school. Uh, professor Lu did his PhD work in Syracuse University in 2011. Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess we were both, I was in Cornell uh, finishing in 2008. Good neighbor. Here in Syracuse. The thing about upstate New York is <laughs> you get used to snow like this, right? So this here oh, is something like come this. On. This is a big storm it's here. It's a piece of cake in Syracuse. Syracuse. They call this like, you know, sweet. Nothing. <laughs> the way that it is. Oh, um, absolutely. But uh, so he's been here since 2011, and I'm really excited to see, uh, see your work. Thanks so Thank much you very much. I appreciate that. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, please introduce myself. Uh, my is Xiaozhong Liu, and I uh, come from uh, the Information and Library Science, and uh, my primary research area in uh, information retrieval and uh, text mining. So I uh, deal with a lot of uh, text, big text data, and uh, in also include some uh, heterogeneous network uh, information. So uh, today we'll talk about a, a, a kind of an interesting project called Heterogeneous Graph Plus Text Mining Enabled uh, Information Understanding. So first, let's take a look at the picture. Uh, probably everybody here, like scholars, you're interested in the academic things, so you must be familiar with the Google Scholar. This is how we as a scholar or student access scholarly information. And uh, most of the time, Google Scholar is uh, doing quite a good job in the information search. So you type a query, and the uh, search engine return a list of uh, publications, which uh, you may highly likely be interested in. And uh, behind uh, Google Scholar, there's no doubt, it's a uh, lots of algorithm work very well to support this kind of engines. For example, I just released a fourth uh, uh, type of research, uh, but there's a lot more. Uh, the first one is scholarly recommendation. So this one, either uh, text-based or uh, graph-based, like citation mining, uh, scholarly, uh, like author recommendation, publication recommendation, venue recommendation stuff here, and also bibliometrics and the central metrics. This is uh, where the library guy is pretty familiar with. So we want to, uh, by using the scholarly data, we want to find what is the most influential, uh, maybe authors or topics uh, at this time. Uh, and also scholarly uh, search system, this is more on the evaluation side, uh, like we want to test efficiency of a different kind of a scholarly search uh, interface. And also scholarly uh, graph mining, that's a little bit more specific in the CS area. Like for example, like a community detection, uh, find a, a scholar really information need. So that's probably something behind uh, the Google, uh, Google Scholar or uh, like the Microsoft Ac Academic Search. Uh, this is a, a pretty interesting, this is a, a was the, uh, the topic, uh, also it's, it's the topic uh, I'm uh, uh, right now engaged as well. But today, I want to talk about something different. I want to talk about uh, the next story. What's next? Uh, uh, when user, when scholar, students have access to those interest scholarly information, so what's next? What's going to be? Okay, so if you type a query, this is uh, probably what Google Scholar returned. This is a piece of paper, uh, some section. So if you give this picture to uh, like student uh, or junior, junior scholars to read, so uh, they may or may not really favor this kind of uh, academic, uh, sorry, so this is uh, kind of a mathematics stuff here. So a lot of students actually comply that, uh, and junior scholar complain that this kind of a content is too hard, it's so hard to uh, understand. So uh, even though Google Scholar may be able to find what you really need and recommend the publications content you may interest in, but not guaranteed you will really understand uh, those information. So that's really a gap here. So this is what my student looks like when they read the paper. I find a couple of my students here, so probably you can tell me if you really cry when you read the paper. But uh, uh, I give some evidence from my last semester, okay? So when I'm teaching uh, Z534, uh, my search information retrieval course, and uh, I have a survey to 37 CS plus data science plus PhD uh, student. They all graduate level in my course. And my course is like a, a, the reading, required reading is like a combination of a textbook, which is easier to understand, about 70% of a textbook and another 30% of uh, academic publications. So this is like a combination. So uh, I ask them uh, different questions. So number one is how effective do you think the class reading helps you to understand and learn the class material? So that uh, feedback is pretty positive. Like most of students, more than 80 students, the feedback uh, say uh, 
but the readings are really helpful, okay? But then they ask another question. So the class reading on average can be uh, difficult, or very difficult. So more than also, uh, more than 70, 75 students reply that the readings are difficult or very difficult. And pay attention, as I mentioned, there are 70% of the readings come from textual book. This textbook is a basic information retrieval book. There is not a, a lot of fancy mathematics inside. This is the basic, like a vector space model, language model, probability theory uh, stuff inside. So still, uh, I'm quite surprised to see still more than 70% or even 80% of students comply that class reading on average can be uh, difficult or very difficult. And also I asked another specific question, how do you think the mathematical formulas in the readings for you? About a, yeah, this the same thing. More than even even more than the last one, it's a more than eighty percent of students complain that the mathematics can be too hard. Once again, mentioned this is just a basic uh, class textbook. So you can tell uh, if you give uh, like student or graduate student or scholars uh, conference papers, uh, the fancy conference papers, uh, you will find that this read will increase probably dramatically because most of the time the conference uh, proceeding. You won't have a 10 page limitation, and uh, authors do not have enough space to provide a background information. So you will find that the, the papers can be very hard uh, to understand. So this is uh, uh, basically what I found. So today, I uh, want to talk about uh, this interesting problem. So the information need for the student, no matter student or scholars, uh, their information need for scholars is not just access information but they also need, need and interest in understanding information. So uh, the basic assumption here is information access not necessarily means information understanding, okay? So uh, today I wanna talk a little bit about automatic uh, scholarly information understanding for the algorithm, the system design. So this is a, an experiment I did. After I found this problem, I started thinking about a different solution. I tried different things to help students better understand the paper. I tried different things. This is one, one uh, experiment I tried three years ago. So when I give students access to the paper uh, here, the content of the paper, this, this paper is a classical reading in uh, information retrieval. It's a lang about a language model, smoothing paper. Uh, it's not very challenging. Uh, it's published in uh, uh, 1998. Uh, and uh, so this paper uh, has some mathematics, not a lot. So when I give student the paper itself, student comply, the paper is uh, just too hard. I have no idea what the probability theory inside the paper, the formulas. And after I give student access for the paper, I also give them access to some, uh, some stuff, some other uh, digital objects which highly likely uh, relevant to this, to this publication. For example, I give student access for the Wikipedia entry for the language model, and I give them the uh, slides, a presentation slide from the author, and I give them the tutorial of this algorithm. I give them the source code of this, of this paper, of this section, it's basically the implementation of some algorithm. And also a, le uh, a video lecture is not from the author, but another guy uh, talked about uh, some similar algorithm and the data set of the paper. So I give students everything they can choose whatever they like, including, uh, I think most of them are PhD students. I remember it's about seven PhD students who participate in the, the game. And also, uh, uh, and, uh, and first give them the paper and then give them this resource and ask them, do you think this resource helps you to understand the paper or not? And uh, another experiment I, I, I made is uh, I, I uh, uh, write a very easy uh, algorithm. It's a QA algorithm. Uh, so basically, student can ask any question about uh, the paper content. For example, based on the paper, student asks, what is the latent semantic indexing? So this is the algorithm name. Uh, and uh, uh, when after student uh, asks the question, I will search this question in our academic database. Uh, so sometimes I will return uh, original paper of this algorithm. This is original paper, uh, also a classical reading. And, uh, and other times uh, I return uh, the slides of LSI, the slides of Wikipedia, uh, sorry, the Wikipedia uh, of uh, LSI and also the video lecture of LSI. And I ask the student which one you prefer, which one help you better understand the content of this algorithm. And, uh, uh, 71.4 uh, student uh, uh, 
uh, reply that this uh, kind of a resource, uh, this kind of resource, not the uh, original academic paper, uh, help them a lot more to understand the the the, the, uh, the content of the uh, of the algorithm. Okay, so that's pretty positive. Uh, and a similar similar thing here, almost all the students reply that uh, this this kind of access this uh, resource will be very helpful. So, uh, based on this based on this. Uh, uh, observations. So uh, w I uh, propose three research questions, and we can talk about it. that. The first one is how this uh, we call. By the way, we call this uh, OER, Open Educational Res Resource. Open Educational Resource. Uh, I, I propose three questions. The first one is how automatically. Uh, uh, sorry, this is this is wrong. Uh, automatically auto generated OER. How how we can automatically generate OER for very large digital library. And number two is how to design the uh, uh, innovative reading and learning environment uh, for information understanding. And uh, number three is how to calculate, automatic calculate student scholar information need while reading a publication. The third one can be really hard, but uh, uh, the, the first two is relatively easier. So we can take the one at a piece. So the first one is a uh, probably easy thing. So how to automatically generate OERs for a very large amount of publications in the digital library? Okay. So uh, the first, the the the, the premise is that uh, those information already available. For example, the presentation slides, uh, the video lecture, and the Wikipedia Wikipedia page already exist online. So the things what we need to do is to search, send a number of queries online and uh, find those information and index them in the database. So this is what we could do. And we call this algorithm a meta search, meta search algorithm. So for example, for Wikipedia page, I just download all the Wikipedia dump in my central database. And I can send a query and to Wikipedia dump and find the relevant information here. And also for tutorial, I send it to Google search engine. For slides, I send it to Google and slide share. Uh, for video, I send it to video pad and video lecture, and the data set to Google, and the source code, I send it to Google uh, GitHub, sorry, I forget GitHub here, Google GitHub and uh, SourceForge, and to download uh, the, the, the source code related to each uh, topic in the uh, scientific uh, repository. And uh, so this is the query uh, I send to the search engine. So here is a, uh, it's a little bit interesting. So you will find if you send the, the publication title to those search engines, most of the time the feedback is negative. Uh, the search engine won't give you anything like feedback because the title is too long or abstract is too long. You won't be able to find a lot of a uh, good resource. So that's the reason I uh, use a different algorithm, uh, two step. The first step is I will infer the topic, automatically infer the topic of each uh, publication. So here, I my assumption is each paper is a multinormal distribution of the topic. Okay. So for example, like uh, if David write a paper, so maybe probability theory, maybe graph mining, maybe uh, text mining, maybe image image search. So this is a, a distribution probability di di distribution for different topics uh, for a specific paper. And then uh, because it's a supervised learning, so uh, each uh, each topic is labeled by a keyword, okay. So and then I can send the keyword to the search engine and find a, a list of resources. Then I will aggregate all the re uh, all the resources from multiple topics uh, for the uh, uh, for the publication. So uh, the first step is to it's uh, so a two steps. First, collect the resource for each keyword. Second is collect the rank the keyword for uh, based on the textual information for the publication. So at the back end, this is uh, called labeled LDA algorithm. So uh, so here, uh, probably you, everybody familiar with LDA, so you will find that this part is very like LDA, but this part is a little bit special. This is a label. So they provide a, a label, uh, a topic label for each topic. This label is critically important because uh, the label of the topic help us to uh, understand the content of the topic. And uh, because each topic have a label, so that's the reason we can send the label to the search engine and uh, find a relevant uh, resource. So here, uh, but uh, the the problem is we may be able to get a num a large number of open uh, uh, educational resource, but not necessarily means this resource uh, quality is very high. 
Later, I'll give you some example. But based on the information retrieval experience, the bad result may pollute uh, the result and finally hurt uh, the learning and reading uh, efficiency. So I'll give an example here. If the topic is QA here, if you send it to Wikipedia engine, and you will find sometimes uh, you find uh, like open domain question answer. So that is probably a good resource. But you may also find some other like question and answer, which is an album. Uh, so that's uh, from a from search viewpoint, from language model viewpoint. These they, they both very good match. Uh, they both ma very good match. But the problem is this one uh, and this one. Uh, the, uh, you will find uh, the, the topic is a really good match, but this one, the topic match is uh, pretty bad. Uh, so that's the reason for the first part for the uh, OER relevance for topic, we use the LDA-based inference. So because LDA inference is not just based on a single word, it's based on a word distribution. In LDA, we call it this uh, 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 beta distribution. So uh, based on this distribution, we can find uh, whether this is a good match or this is a good match. And for the paper, we use a language model. So uh, for the language model, is uh, each uh, publication is, we assume, is a multinormal distribution of word. It's also a probability distribution. So we use these two algorithms uh, to find a match. And we find that the accuracy performance uh, goes up significantly. But however, this is also not the final answer for this problem because uh, you will find, probably for Wikipedia, probably for uh, the t tutorial, for some uh, for some uh, data set and for some GitHub, because they have a rich amount, uh, a lot of textual information. So most of the time, this performance can be good, but not necessarily for the uh, video presentation and the slides. Sometimes you cannot automatically extract the textual information from the video from the from the slides. Uh, maybe if uh, if David give us a help, maybe we can extract some textual feature from the video. But uh, uh, probably this is also a very hard task if we extract a very high quality video uh, content information. So it can be very hard. So if we simply depend on the the, the text description from the YouTube, you will find uh, uh, the search quality uh, even for the LDA uh, inference, the performance can be very very low here. So uh, we may need to find some other uh, uh, algorithm to figure out. Uh, this difficulty. So we find something interesting here. So when, for example, when we type like the QA here in the YouTube case, and we find that this is a good, this is a good uh, video, help, highly likely able to help students understand the paper. And we find something interesting, the high quality video, high quality resource here, always uh, uh, co-occur uh, with the other high quality recommended videos. So if this one talk about the QA as an algorithm NLP, this one, the related ones also talk about NLP. Uh, quality also pretty high here. And uh, here, if this one is not a, uh, not talk about a, like a QA algorithm, and you will find that this part also, uh, the related video also not talk about a QA algorithm here. So the Low quality uh, videos always co-occur with uh, low quality video. High quality video always co-occur with high quality video. Uh, because the reason is uh, uh, at the back of uh, YouTube, uh, most of the time they find there, there's some paper support that. So, so YouTube uh, find uh, the relationship between the videos by the co-click behavior. So if you click this video and then click the next video, so they find uh, the mutual information of these two videos can be very high. So that's the reason the, uh, the videos from the same category always co-occur uh, together. So that's the reason. Uh, so based on this, uh, we propose a new uh, method to solve this problem. It's a heterogeneous graph mining problem. For, uh, we then create a very large uh, heterogeneous uh, network. Uh, for example, each K here is a keyword uh, base label, keyword labeled topic. And uh, which, because it's a uh, multinormal distribution, so one paper may have multiple keyword here is a high relationship. Also, this uh, keyword may be contributed by a number of paper as well. Pay attention, these two relations can be different. For example, uh, David write a paper about uh, image retrieval. And uh, so his paper here will have uh, this image retrieval topic. But uh, because his work uh, may be cite by a lot of information retrieval guys. 
Okay, so basically his work contributes to the information retrieval field, but his paper not necessarily have uh, information retrieval as an explicit topic here. And uh, uh, also the other topic may set a topic and the topic may co-occur with other topic and the topic is may similar or related to a specific resource and the resource may relate to another resource. This is for example like YouTube co-occur uh, or like uh, 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 like uh, GitHub co-occur or like a Wikipedia incoming link or outgoing link. So I create a, a pretty big uh, with uh, uh, about a 10 million nodes uh, heterogeneous uh, graph here. Uh, because I use it for my class teaching, so here uh, I also automatically parse uh, the syllabus. So here W1 is more like a uh, weekly topic. So for example, W1, uh, the first topic I introduced a number of topics also on the, I put it on the heterogeneous uh, uh, graph here. So then something interesting is uh, uh, we convert a text mining, uh, text mining problem into a graph mining problem, more specifically, more like a heterogeneous uh, graph mining problem. So the user queries, the student query, may come from a, uh, may equals to a paper node plus some topic node, so on the graph. So not necessarily just uh, represented by text, but also represented by a number of seed node. And uh, pay attention, this node may have some uh, probability distribution here. So the OER ranking problem becomes a random work problem on the heterogeneous uh, uh, graph here. So this is a, uh, the graph description. Uh, we have uh, about a, uh, 10 or 12 different kind of edges and uh, six different kind of nodes. So I'll give an example here. So if student, when they read the paper, they find that this topic K2 is very difficult to understand here. So this K2 may cite like K1. So these two topics have a very close relationship. And this K1 uh, may relate to another paper. So this paper have a very high uh, relationship with uh, uh, relativeness with this topic K1 here. And K1 also related to resource R2. And also paper two also have a, a relationship with R2 then uh, basically uh, by using random work, we find that the topic K2 and R2 have a very close relationship. So if we give student access of R2, maybe a Wikipedia page, maybe a YouTube video, will help student understand the K2 uh, when they read a specific paper. So this is a random work, uh, random work algorithm basically. Because it is a heterogeneous graph, so we have to tell machine, tell uh, the, the random work uh, algorithm, uh, what kind of path they want to, they may need to follow, okay? Uh, so f uh, so this algorithm we call the meta path algorithm. So it's not really a path, instead it's a path on the heterogeneous graph scheme, okay? So it's a list of a node on the heterogeneous graph scheme. It's not an individual node, in instance, instead it's the, uh, it's, it's, it's the node uh, category here. So the relationship between uh, VI and VG, this two node, is based on the random work probability from one node to the other, following this specific meta path on the graph, uh, on the graph scheme. And uh, so uh, between this node, the two, there can be multiple different kind of a tour. Okay, for each tour, uh, basically we uh, accumulate uh, their uh, uh, weight, the, 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 age, the age transitioning probability from one node to the other. So this is a random work, uh, basic random work algorithm here. I'll just give an example here. For example, uh, K is uh, the topic. If user uh, have a question about LDA, they, have, they need uh, some help to understand the, the content of, uh, of LDA. So the uh, LDA always co-occur in the publications, always co-occur with the multi-normal distribution. And the multi-normal distribution uh, on the uh, related to Wiki some Wikipedia uh, page, like multi-normal distribution itself, and also probability theory. And also, uh, this kind of a page always link to, highly likely link to, uh, not very normal distribution here. So uh, then the algorithm, uh, based on this meta path, based on this meta path, uh, this meta path al also can be, you can, you can think about like a ranking function, okay, it's a ranking function. So this ranking function is just uh, basically tell us 
if give student access to this Wikipedia page, highly likely will help student understand the original uh, LDA, uh, LDA topic here. So this is a helpful, can be helpful. I'll give another example. If this is, this is a for paper to help students understand that the paper of LDA, this is not a specific topic, this is a, the LDA original paper. <coughs> so uh, this, this meta path is a little bit interesting. At the, at the beginning is the paper itself, at the end also is the paper itself. But the goal is actually the third one, it's a, it's a resource uh, in the middle. So we can find that this paper, uh, when we send a query to GitHub, it's highly likely related to a number of open source uh, project, basically LDA implementation. And all of these three have a strong link to this specific page. And uh, this GitHub uh, project also relate to the original uh, LDA topic. Then based on this meta path, we find that this, this GitHub project have uh, the highest probability to be relevant uh, to the original LDA topic here. So highly likely this uh, GitHub project will be able to help students understand the LDA content here. <coughs> so this is a, a two basic uh, examples. So we're not finished yet. So uh, the text, the text part is easier, always easier, okay? Because the text part, we have language model, we have LDA, and we have different algorithm to support, to help us understand the content. How about uh, this one? The formula is <laughs> even more challenging, right? The formula itself do not associate with a, a lot of good text. Even though the formula may associate with some context uh, in the publication, that may be helpful. But understand that uh, this formula uh, in the reading is always very tough. Uh, this is a, a this this formula actually is an LDA inference uh, algorithm, and uh, a lot of students find that this formula is incredible. It's so hard. Uh, so how how to and then. Uh, I think about how to help students understand each formula, even when the formula is very complex, all the formula do not have enough context, how to help scholars and students to understand this kind of formula. That's another big challenge. And so if you take a look at this, this formula, okay, this formula actually have a different piece. We may be able to cut the formula into a different piece, okay? And then uh, you think about if the formula itself is too complex, how about we can deconstruct the formula into a different piece and help student scholar understand each piece at a time? Maybe it, it, maybe it will work. So for example, this one uh, may evolve from these two basic function, okay? You don't worry about uh, what this function really mean, but these two function really uh, evolve into this function, maybe more than two, okay? I just give a example. So this two formulas we can find related or can highly likely evolute to this bigger or more complex function. And these two functions also come from a more easier uh, basic function here. So if we can somehow in the scientific repository, we have millions of paper. If we can extract all the formulas from the publications, from tutorial, from Wikipedia, maybe we have millions of formulas. Some formulas are very easy, some formulas are very challenging, okay? If we can construct all the formulas into a huge tree, something like this, okay? And each node here is a formula, okay? And when the tree goes up, 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 and you will find the formula becomes easier, easier, and easier, okay? So one student scholar have a difficulty understand the specific uh, formula here, and we can always trace back and help them to access an easier formula in the top of the tree, okay? Then highly likely, the one they have access to the top of the tree, the, 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 the Asians, and it will highly likely help them to understand <coughs> more difficult child uh, formula, more challenging formulas, okay? So we call this formula uh, evolution tree, okay? So basically to build the connections of all the formulas in the scientific uh, uh, repository. And then uh, this data structure can be even uh, enhanced uh, by adding the open educational resource. For example, on each node here, you can find that this one, because it comes from LDA paper, so this one associated with the LDA Wikipedia page. So this one is actually uh, 
uh, virtual ad distribution. So it's also associated with the original Wikipedia page. This is a beta distribution. This is a Bayesian inference. So it's associated with different uh, Wikipedia page and also associated with the video lectures and other uh, tutorials as well. Okay, so if we give students and scholars this uh, information access right here, it may or may not help them understand this part uh, automatically. Okay, so this is, the, this is the goal. We call that the extended uh, uh, formula evolution tree here. So then the next question is how we really uh, implement that. Uh, you can find that these two formulas look, uh, these two parts look similar, okay, look somehow similar. But uh, uh, sometimes researchers use a different uh, like alpha, beta, gamma to represent uh, some similar content, okay. So, so if I said uh, like a, a paper from David, so maybe David originally used uh, like alpha, beta, I used uh, just gamma and theta somehow in my paper. I just personal preference, okay. So uh, we, not just to find a similarity between the, the formulas, but also we need to find the, the layout, the layout of the formulas. If uh, you guys using uh, LaTeX to write the paper, probably were quite familiar with uh, the layout information because in, uh, uh, I uh, always uh, recommend my student use uh, LaTeX because they can write very beautiful formulas very easily, okay. So this is, uh, uh, we need to, uh, Basically, for each formula from PDF, we need to, or from Wikipedia, we need to take it and uh, uh, recover the original uh, LaTeX layout. Basically, this is the goal. Give an example here. A squared uh, plus B squared equals one. This is a very easy uh, understanding formula here. So by using uh, the layout mining, we uh, convert this formula into a tree like this. This is how you generate the, 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 uh, the LaTeX uh, information. When you type something like this, uh, a LaTeX will convert into a formula, okay? And so this is the, the formula layout. So by, by using this formula layout, uh, we convert to another different form. We replace the variable with star V and uh, we replace the constant with uh, star C, okay? Because as I said, like if David used alpha, beta, I use gamma and theta, so these two variables can be different, okay? So uh, we convert this one, fin this, is, this is the final layout information for each formula. No matter how complex the formula is, we can always uh, convert to uh, the layout. And then uh, after we have this kind of information, we can basically calculate the similarity between, uh, between the uh, two uh, formulas. And so if we have formula one and formula two, we need to find the relationship between them. The first one is the similarity between the layout uh, information or the partial layout. Uh, for example, uh, David have a formula very, very complex. I just use the first piece of this formula, okay? So uh, I need to calculate the similarity of part of the formula for, from David and the whole formula from me to calculate uh, this similarity. And the second one is we, uh, we uh, get access to uh, 240K PDF publications from ACM, full text, PDF based. And then we extract all the formulas from this uh, repository and uh, calculate the similarity and the probability of match uh, between uh, the formulas. Uh, because this formula may belong to a paper, this formula also belongs to a di another different paper, okay? So we can calculate the probability that one paper cite another. Also, we uh, crawl the Wikipedia page and uh, extract all the formulas from the Wikipedia page as well. In Wikipedia, the bad news is we don't know if two pages, they are interconnected, they, they, they are connected. We have no idea which one is easy or which one is, uh, is more challenging, okay? But we know these two formula, they are uh, connected. We can also calculate this probability here. Okay, so anyway, finally, we, we can, we'll be able to construct a, quite a giant tree with um, three, more than three uh, millions of uh, formulas on the evolution tree, formula evolution tree, and plus uh, two million OERs on the extended formula evolution tree to help students understand which single uh, uh, formula uh, in the publication context. So let's take a look at the, the, the system. Uh, this is a probably something interesting. Uh, this one is my first 
This is my first try. This is the first system I create. I call it Scholar Wiki. So after I uh, create a lot of OERs for each publication, and then I use a machine learning algorithm to generate a Wikipedia page, very like Wikipedia page, not, not really Wikipedia. Uh, uh, I created my own uh, Wiki service called Scholar Wiki, and uh, a machine learning algorithm create a Wiki, wiki page for each publication, okay? And uh, because after the earlier talk, and uh, I'll be able to figure out the resource related to the paper. The same thing I create an author wiki page and the keyword a topic wiki page. So I put these uh, <coughs> uh, OERs into the Wikipedia page. And uh, also here, a student can click this question, ask a question about this paper, okay? And the student, they can also, uh, uh, basically these two parts is generated by the models I just mentioned, the graph mining model and the text mining model here. So if student do not satisfy the OERs recommended by the system, they can always uh, use the edit function to enhance this page. Whenever they edit the page, uh, in the database, I write a trigger, okay? This trigger function will trigger uh, to generate a number of positive and negative machine learning instance. So the machine learning model will enhance as well. So the model is trying to learn. For example, I have a one million publications. I create a machine learning, create a one million wiki page. If user just added like a 1%, so the other 99% of the wiki, wiki page will be enhanced automatically by learning the editing behavior from student, okay? Uh, this idea, when I write a code, uh, I write a code for half a year for this system. I'm very exciting, I see. I find something pretty impressive. Uh, this can be uh, help my student. But uh, <laughs> after half a year, when I give access to my student, uh, everybody say thinks uh, it seems helpful, but uh, we really don't want to use it. <laughs> because uh, uh, this system is, uh, uh, it looks good theoretically, but uh, actually we increase our working load. When uh, I take your course, I read a paper from you, and you give me another, an, another information load to open another wiki page, and you even push me to edit the wiki page. Y you are evil. I, I don't want to really use your system. So this is their feedback, okay? I, I say I totally understand that, okay? Totally, totally understand that. So this is actually, this, this, this area, uh, as Patrick here, he know that this is more like a human computation. Uh, so for human c computation, actually the most critical p part is incentive. <coughs> How to motivate a student user to really use the system. This is, this is the key, okay? So, uh, and also once student read the paper, hopefully we'll be able to catch student real time information need. So that's the reason last year I proposed something new. It's called uh, OER-based collaborative PDF reader. So this reader has three functions. The first one is capture student reading behavior, okay? So for example, like student highlight something, or ask some question, or whatever other behavior when they read a PDF-based paper. And the second one is based on their reading behavior, automatically read, uh, recommend the, the, the OER resource to the student. And uh, the third one is other student uh, will be able to collaborate with uh, the user and to uh, help him or her uh, understand the specific piece uh, part which uh, he or she confused. So let's take a look at the system. <coughs> so this looks very like PDF, right? This looks very like PDF. But I rewrite the PDF API here. So uh, one student or scholar highlight a specific part of the paper, like this paragraph, or formula, and uh, maybe he or she don't understand very well. And right click the mouse, and uh, there is a new function called get help. So uh, one, uh, and uh, uh, he or she can select the specific kind of OER, and the system will recommend some OER uh, to help them understand this specific uh, piece here. And or even they can make it even better. And one day, uh, and and they can highlight something, and they can choose to ask a specific question about this specific piece. So uh, basically, this is the evidence. The whole paper is the evidence. The topic is the evidence, and the question is the evidence. So based on the evidence, we want to estimate what kind of a resource 
will be able to help them understand the paper. Uh, and uh, once again, at the back end, we have the LDA uh, model and we have the text language model based search and we have also graph mining piece. So all the algorithm get together and help them to recommend the resource, help them to understand the th this specific part. And also, once they ask the question, you, you will see there is, a, there is a question mark show up right here in color in blue, okay? And so the other student, when they open the paper, read the paper, and uh, they will find, okay, right here, I have uh, uh, other student, my colleague, have a question at this place, okay? They can click uh, this question, and they will be able to see other people's question, and they will be able to see other people's uh, feedback uh, for, the, uh, for each specific type. Uh, and also, they, they will be able to add some comments here, that so they, they may show a, another different kind of a mark here. So this is the comments uh, for this question. So basically the red one come from, uh, come from me, the instructor. I'm a super user there. And the blue one comes from, from the student, from the peers. So this is uh, uh, the system. And you will find one student open this, open this PDF and uh, you will find uh, actually already uh, there are some, uh, some marks, either question or comment marks on the PDF. Uh, so this is, uh, this we call the collaboration. That's the reason we call the collaboration. So the collaboration not just between the, s the user and the algorithm, but also between the user as well, and also the user and the instructor as well. So the last one is the most challenging one. I, I won't spend a lot of time. So this is a basically my future work. Okay, but I will uh, show you some uh, preliminary result. Uh, how to use the really a challenging model, mathematic model, to help us to characterize what a student really need when they read a paper, okay? So <coughs> when they read a the paper, the system help us to capture a lot of evidence, for example, like ex explicit evidence, like when they uh, explicit the question when they read a paper, okay? The implicit evidence, like uh, when students highlight a specific section, paragraph, or sentence, okay? Or highlight the formula or the reading time when they read, uh, when they spend a lot of time on a specific paragraph, uh, sorry, on a specific section or page, or uh, some topics, uh, so on and so forth. This is a, a implicit and explicit evidence. So based on the evidence, uh, if we use the earlier model, the earlier model, we can use uh, uh, the ranking function, the, the ranking function on the heterogeneous graph, okay? So for example, we can have some online features. For example, student highlight, H means highlight, similarity to the target uh, uh, resource. Okay, this is the online part. And also have offline function. This is a pre-index. So for example, a topic related to a resource, rela resource related to the other resource, and this resource also concentrate on the original topic, student have question so on and so forth. We call that a ranking, uh, we propose 21 different ranking functions. Each function is also a ranking feature, okay? And if we don't have student feedback, for example, student didn't have a chance to click the feedback like a useful or not useful, then we can use human uh, tuning, uh, manually set up uh, the, uh, the parameters. So basically we assume the online features are more important. The offline features are less important. But if user provide us a little bit of feedback, maybe just hundreds of feedback, we were able to train the system by using learning to rank model. Learning to rank model, just a machine learning model. The, the different thing is for learning to rank, each feature is a ranking function. It's not a just a numeric feature, it's a ranking function, okay? So the machine learning model will compose a, a very, very com complex uh, mathematic model which you don't necessarily understand what it is, but this is just a mathematic model uh, to help you to optimize the ranking uh, the performance, but you have to ha provide a machine because it's supervised. You have to provide a machine the training examples. So this is the graph I uh, construct. I uh, have a 41K publications from ACM and uh, uh, also about a 1 million uh, OER resource create a, a pretty large heterogeneous graph and uh, using U4J to index that. Uh, <coughs> and I find a 51 student, uh, master level, PhD level, to uh, participate in this, uh, this experiment. Uh, so this is the result. 
here. Okay, the result uh, probably a little bit hard to consume, but here probably you can just pay attention to this one. Uh, MRR means uh, mean reciprocal ranking. So this one is uh, always used by QA, QA system. QA system, uh, when you ask a question, uh, the system will automatically give you a number of answers. So the first correct answer position is the uh, MRR rate. If this one is very high, it's equals one, it means the correct answer always show up in the first position. If it's a 0 0.5, it means the, the, the correct position always in the, in, the, in the second position. So right now it's about a, a 0.8, so it means uh, the, the, the first one or two result highly likely be positive uh, that student rate. So, uh, and uh, this is the some, stati some statistic, uh, statistics, uh, some uh, about 21 is very good, uh, sorry, good, and uh, 29 about okay, and uh, uh, for bad is about uh, 40 percent. And this is the axis array uh, for the student, about uh, uh, Six student, uh, uh, six percent of the student, uh, uh, thirty-six uh, student uh, percent of student that believe the system is uh, helpful or very uh, helpful, and uh, also uh, for the accuracy of the recommendation result. So uh, about uh, uh, thirty-two percent of students think most of the time uh, the result is uh, helpful. Uh, Forty-four percent, about uh, fifty percent of the time, uh, the result is uh, helpful. Uh, and also some other statistics. So basically, it's a result is pretty positive, I think, but uh, of course have enough space to uh, improve in the future. Uh, wait a minute, so this is my last part of the talk. So here, maybe so far, we already simplify this problem, okay? Because we didn't address a very, very important issue yet is personalization, okay? Different user may have a different preference for information understanding for their information need, even when they read the same publication or have a question for the same topic. Give an example here. A professor, a CS, CS guy, and a library science guy, they all read this paper right here, and they all have question in this piece, okay? So the professor may be interested in the background, not just con just, 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 just interest in this specific paper, but uh, he, he or she may also interest in the citing or cited paper from the original paper, okay? And this paper may be related to some videos or uh, source code, and this professor may want to see the background of the paper, okay? And uh, for CS student, CS student, um, <coughs> most time in my class, uh, they don't interest in, I'm sorry, CS student here, uh, most of the time, CS student uh, master level didn't really interest in the complex mathematic model, but they're very interested in the implementations part, okay? So CS student may prefer to access a source code of this paragraph, okay? But the library science student, they may interest in the background information, though, so they may not interest in the source code. Instead, they may interest in the uh, Wikipedia page. So different users, when they access the same publication, same topic, they, their information need can be different. So that's my next goal, personalization. An example like, if on the heterogeneous graph, there are three different, only three different relations. One is citation relation, another is a topic to wiki, another is topic to source code. <coughs> you will find highly likely professors may like this, may, may think this, this relation very useful. The other one not very useful. This is a probability di distribution. For CS student, this one is basically not useful, but uh, this one is uh, a little bit useful, and this one is the most useful, maybe. And for library student, maybe this one is the most useful one. The other one is not that useful, okay? So the goal is how to, how to generate this big matrix for each user uh, individual, okay? And uh, then if we can get uh, such a uh, matrix, we can make the things, the random work much more accurate so the random more function become from one node to the other become, so this part is transitioning age, transition probability, okay? But here, this part is more interesting. It's a personalized age type usefulness uh, probability, okay? So, uh, and so, uh, but the key is how to generate uh, this probability function. And uh, uh <coughs> just 
I just got a result last week, actually, for a different uh, uh, stuff. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the algorithm more in more detail. I use the EM algorithm. Uh, in the so to summarize is <coughs> in the E step, I will have a personalized random walk on the graph and to find the most important uh, uh, node. And uh, in the M step, I will update the user profile. Basically, is the age type usefulness distribution uh, uh, to optimize the ranking uh, result from the E step. Kay. And this is some very preliminary result. This is a music sharing uh, data set. This is not a, this, this data set, because this one's larger. I uh, have a lot of training examples, because for this one, I only have 50 students, so the training is, uh, data set is not good enough here. So this one is each music can be shared in different way, for example, like playlist, the artist, the album. Uh, and the user, so on and so forth, different kind of a relationship. And you will find uh, for some user, uh, user play song is more important than the other. For the playlist, some user are very important, some user are not important. And for the artist category, some category, uh, some genre is important, some genre is not important. So it's more like when we recommend uh, like music for this user one, like the he or she may prefer to, to find the music by using the artist uh, genre and playlist information, and this user may only prefer uh, for the uh, artist information. And uh, this is uh, some uh, preliminary result. So it seems that uh, uh, the personalized uh, uh, random walk algorithm works better uh, than the other uh, state of art uh, baseline uh, method. Okay, summarize. Uh, so I'm interested in information understanding to help a student, a scholar, understand by using uh, different kind of uh, OERs. <coughs> so the methodology I use is the heterogeneous graph plus text-based approach for OER recommendation. And uh, I'm very interested to uh, design and implement uh, the novel reading and the learning uh, environment. But the personalized uh, information need, the characterization is the, is the key uh, here for the next step. Uh, so next, work with uh, the education researcher for the OER-based, they call it scaffolding. So basically help someone understand something. And uh, they designed a more sophisticated uh, recommendation algorithm, like a uh, community-based recommendation. And uh, work, work with uh, HCI uh, researcher uh, like Patrick to, uh, for the learning environment design and uh, uh, evaluation. And also I'm working very hard right now on the PDF uh, based uh, reading behavior extraction, uh, and uh, also uh, some implementation and evaluation in the uh, peer plus instructor collaboration at a MOOC environment will be uh, will be very uh, useful and interesting uh, for the next step. So it's still open question, uh, I think for now. Okay, that's it. Uh, that's some uh, existing publications. Uh, some uh, will be submitted soon. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you. to get something for I, I think it was for Watson so where they will get a, a square link with this keyword and mm. they were interested in getting in highlighting the specific text that will address this question maybe that might not apply but that's what they need mm -hmm. so when you are recommending resources are you recommending resources with the entire link or an entire or do are you actually giving them a highlight mm. <coughs> the paragraph within that wiki page that will actually yeah, so uh, I think what you mentioned is an uh, uh, information retrieval called uh, the uh, context, context search. Like uh, uh, there is a, uh, some functionality in the <coughs> uh, provided by Microsoft Word and also uh, uh, Adobe uh, PDF is you highlight something and you can automatically send the query to maybe Google or Yahoo and get some relevant uh, resource. They call it contextual, contextual search. So this algorithm is not based on, just based on the highlight information, but also based on the, the document and even the proximity model based on the word uh, before, after the central piece of text. So there is a number of uh, algorithms support that. So actually uh, this uh, system use some features uh, from this kind of research. 
like when you user student highlight something and we'll be able to extract this information and send it to send it to the, uh, the, the, the index and the final result. So we use this as a ranking feature, but that's not all of those because for uh, scholarly data, the good news is everything is interconnected. For example, like the, <coughs> uh, the formulas, they are not isolated, uh, exist. Okay, so all the formulas and to scientific topic, they are closely related. So if a student reading a paper or formula relatively difficult, so why not we take a break from this specific paper and uh, jump to some background topics and give them help for the back end, the, 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 the background topics, and uh, eventually will help them better understand this piece. So that's the, uh, that makes this project more interesting and uh, more, uh, uh, more challenging, so I would say. So yes, there's a build on something like IBM or Adobe is using, yeah. But don't, don't worry that too much because we, the finally there is a machine learning model. So we give all the features to the machine learning model. Machine learning model will make decision. If they find a specific ranking feature is not that useful, machine learning model basically will, will, will punish uh, that feature. <coughs> that can be that can be useful. So it's what once again for the for the for the mining we have basically two approach, one is supervised and other is unsupervised. So the existing research always find that supervised is much better than unsupervised. So if we can somehow find in a paper some topic or some part are more confusing for specific student or for all the student, we can always enhance the weight of specific part. For example, purposely enhance the LDA based topic distribution for that specific piece. And so basically give these kind of features a higher weight by using human reading behavior data. That's totally feasible, okay? But uh, once again, finally, uh, the key is we need the evaluation. So that's the reason uh, some students use my system and they generate a lot of uh, training data. And so we need to test whether this kind of feature will be really useful or not, okay, by using the training data. So I assume yes. So, but uh, how to really mathematically uh, characterize this, this part can be challenging. Thank you. All right, I think I have one more. Do you have a few minutes to stick around if people have questions about anything? Uh, sure, I will be staying here. Okay, so, okay. okay. So, 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 if you have uh, more questions, you sure. can ask. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.